Hello once again friends, neighbors, and fellow Christians, and welcome back to another video where we are searching the scriptures as we investigate these typical objections that are raised against preterism. Uh, as you know, uh, in the previous videos, uh, I began a series of lessons where we are investigating uh, these typical objections that, that are always raised uh, from the futurist paradigm in the order to, or with the idea of trying to refute uh, the uh, preterist viewpoint of Scripture. And the document that I received in the email uh, was written by a brother, Travis Main, from Sparta, Ohio. And I've been using this uh, not pointed at anybody in particular, but because these typical objections, uh, as I said, are typical. Uh, it's, it's because of the ideology, the theology, uh, which comes from the futurist paradigm. Uh, and this is what we've been investigating in uh, our search for the truth uh, on these matters and how we uh, look at these various passages uh, that are used uh, in the attempt to refute preterism. And today, uh, I want us to consider uh, in particular and in depth, uh, a little more in depth than usual perhaps, uh, Revelation 1 and verse 7, where the phrase is found there that every eye will see him coming in the clouds. And before we go on, I want to read uh, the fourth paragraph from uh, Brother Main's uh, article here uh, as we uh, continue looking at this passage. Now, he says, <clears throat> Revelation 1 verse 7 makes the claim that, quote, every eye will see Christ coming in the clouds. Most Christians trying to reject the 70 AD doctrine think this verse is a slam dunk. In response, preterists describe a touchdown at a football game. An announcer may state, every eye was on that pass. However, was every eye? Think about a football stadium. You have all ages. Some toddler in the sea of people was probably more interested in the contents of his nose than the football. Other people were likely in the restroom or at the snack stand. So how is it that every eye was on that pass? The fact is, they were not. Thus, the preterists established that Revelation 1 and verse 7 is just a figure of speech. Now, do you see what he has done? He has just shot his doctrine, his objection, in the foot by establishing the fact for us, handing me my argument, that uh, Revelation 1 and verse 7 is <laughs> just a figure of speech. So, But I want you to notice here what he does next. Okay, he says, uh, the fact is they were not. Thus, the preterist establishes that Revelation 1 and verse 7 is just a figure of speech. Rather, now watch, here's his rebuttal to the fact that he has just established. Rather, the people of Jerusalem were said to be very aware of the invasion of their city, which was supposed to be the second coming of Jesus. Okay, this is, uh, this is a very bad... Uh, this, this is a misrepresentation uh, because uh, the preterist viewpoint does not say that the invasion of Jerusalem was the second coming. That is not what Jesus taught in the Olivet Discourse. Uh, Jesus taught that when the temple would be destroyed, that that would be the sign of his parousia, not that the invasion was the second coming. Okay, but now here, here's what I want you to notice. Okay, he said, rather, the people of Jerusalem were said to be very aware of the invasion of their city, which was supposed to be the second coming of Jesus. If the verse is understood as written, I didn't make that up. Do you see that? If the verse is understood as written, it is demonstrated the whole world will literally see Jesus in the clouds at his return and all the faithful will join him. Now, do you see that? He just established the fact for us that Revelation 1 verse 7, every eye shall see him, is a figure of speech. And he's, he wants us to just read the verse as written. See, that's, that's code for don't pay attention to the context. Because I'm going to prove that because I'm going to skip ahead a couple of paragraphs and read uh, what he says about another uh, text here. Now, 
he says in a couple of paragraphs later, he says, in regard to the kingdom of God, it must be remembered that it does not always reference the same thing. The term kingdom is used 316 times in scripture. Actually, that's 316 verses. It's used 342 times, but we get the point. Okay, the term kingdom is used 316 times in scripture. However, God's kingdom is used in only four ways. His universal dominion, Psalms 103, verse 19. The physical nation of Israel, 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 5. The church in the Christian dispensation, Colossians 1 and verse 13. And God's everlasting kingdom, 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. These usages are brought to the forefront to demonstrate, now notice this, Pay attention. Pay very, very close attention to what he says here. These usages, in other words, this is why he's pointing this out. These usages are brought to the forefront to demonstrate that every time, all 342 times, that every time the kingdom is read about, the context must be examined. Do you see? I mean, I, I, I can't make something up that good. With Revelation 1 and verse 7, he proves it for us. That's a figure of speech. But he wants us to understand the verse as written. But when it comes to the kingdom, then every time the kingdom is read about, then the context must be examined. Well, I say that the context must be examined on every passage, on every text, on every term, on every thought and idea that we, we uh, consider. We need to always consider the context every time. And we never want to take a verse or a word just as it is written. Now, uh, thinking about this verse here, we want to look at Revelation 1 and verse 7. Uh, so we will go there. And the verse says, as you are familiar with, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail, and that's the King James Version, because of him, even so, amen. If we look at the New King James, uh, it says, All the tribes of the earth will mourn. And we'll look at that again uh, a little later in the video. But I want us to look at this uh, in, in the context. But again, he said, uh, that the context must be examined in every instance uh, when it comes to that particular point of the kingdom. But again, I say that we need to look at the context in everything that we look at. So the first thing I want us to notice is uh, the context. Revelation 1 and verse 7, what is the context? Well, the context is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, who did know the day and the hour, gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and, sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bare record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. Why? For the time is at hand. Now, brethren, when we look at these first three verses right here, in Revelation. Uh, this is the prologue. This is the introduction to this book, to this prophecy, this vision. And when we look at this, there is no logical reason why that we are not to interpret these time statements just the way, just the way they're written, to, to take uh, Mr. Travis's uh, own words there. But these, uh, this is to be, uh, there, there's no point in, in saying that it doesn't mean exactly what it says, because there, I guess what I'm trying to say is we can't dodge what this says because of the uh, prophetic uh, figurative language that is used in the book of Revelation, because the first three verses are not part of the vision. Uh, they are not uh, to be interpreted in a figurative manner. Uh, this, uh, th these are no different than any other place of when we think about uh, the kingdom is at hand. Uh, and again, as Travis 
uh, pointed out in his document, every time the kingdom is spoken of, why well, the context must be examined. So when we look at the context, the setting, uh, the contents of the book of Revelation are dealing with things that were shortly to come to pass uh, because the time is at hand. But now when we look at verse 7 then, uh, you know, I left you in the last video with the question was, uh, of, uh, was this just a shot in the dark? Or was there more here than, than meets the eye? Uh, and what I was hinting at uh, is, you know, is there something in prophecy uh, of which this is based on? And the answer is yes. And we want to look at this because this is a quotation from Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 where Zechariah said, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and, now here's the quote, They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So John the Revelator is quoting this passage right here uh, in Revelation 1 and verse 7 when he says, And every eye shall see him, and they shall look on me, whom they have pierced. So when we examine the context, and any time a New Testament writer refers or quotes from the Old Testament, then we need to go and investigate the context in that text as well. So when we look at Zechariah 12 and verse 10, then obviously we would ask the question, what is the context? What is this prophecy talking about? And why, why would this statement here, they shall look on me, whom they have pierced, be connected with, he would pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. So, you know, I, I have to ask the question, brethren, when did that occur? When was the spirit of grace poured out upon God's people? When was that? All right, now let's look at the context. If we back up, Notice it says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth. That, uh, it says, And formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when, so here we have a time statement, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now, Brethren, do you see that right there? Be honest and look at this text. Look at this prophecy. This was predicting the siege of Jerusalem. The siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Now, obviously we understand that Jerusalem was besieged in times past. So how do we know that this particular prediction was referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in eighty seventy? Well, that's why, if you'll notice the time statements, these where I have these green highlights, when you go down through this block of prophecy of chapter 12, 13, and 14 of Zechariah, this phrase, in that day, is used, if memory serves, 17 times throughout this text, this, this block of prophecy. And it connects all of this as one prophecy because uh, what he says here about the siege against Judah and Jerusalem, he says, and in that day. Well, in what day? In the day of the siege and destruction against Jerusalem. In that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all the people. And we can follow, we don't have to read the entire text, you can pause the video and take the time to read these three chapters on your own time. And I, and I encourage you to do that, because I'm not going to read the entire uh, text of this, because it just takes too much time. But we notice the phrase, in that day, verse 4, in that day. So he's still talking about the same thing. Verse 6, in that day. So these are things that, we're going to, that are predicted that were going to take place in that time frame. In that day, verse 8, in that day. And he keeps repeating that phrase which connects it to the siege against both Judah and Jerusalem. In that day, all right? And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Well, again, that's, this is the verse 
which John quotes in Revelation 1 and verse 7, where he says, They shall look on me whom they pierced, every eye shall see him coming in the clouds. You see? And this is posited in the time frame of the siege against Judah and Jerusalem in the time frame of the first century when the Spirit of grace would be poured out upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning uh, of uh, had, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, uh, and Megiddon. Okay, now, if we continue the next chapter, in that day, so he's still talking about the same thing. This is still in the same context. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened. And I, now look at this, brethren, and pay attention to this. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Now, brethren, again, I ask the question, what is the only event in the history of the planet that this could be talking about? that is in the context of the siege both against Judah and Jerusalem and in the time frame of a fountain open for the house of David to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I'll cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall be and they shall no more be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Okay, in that day, we see that phrase continues. All right, we come to chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. The day of the Lord. You see that right there, brethren? Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. This will be the day of the Lord that is in the time frame of the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem in the time frame of when the Spirit of grace is poured out upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, when the fountain be opened uh, for sin and uncleanness in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day, so we're still talking about the same context now, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a, great, a very great valley, uh, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And, and when you look at this, um, this is a picture, if you will, an echo of the exodus of the children of Israel and passing through the Red Sea when the Lord fought against in the day of battle against Pharaoh and his armies and they were swallowed up in the Red Sea, but he parted the seas. And we have that that's the picture that is being depicted here of the mountain cleaving so that God's people whom Jesus warned to flee the city when they see those signs and they fled. And this is the picture that is being drawn here. Now and you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, you shall flee like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And Paul quotes this in uh, the Thessalonian letter. And it shall come to pass in that day, again, still in the same context, same time frame, in that day, the light shall not be clear nor dark, dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. Remember what Jesus said? No man has known the day or the hour. And he is echoing what Zechariah is predicting right here. Not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day. Again, still in the same time frame. Notice here, brethren. It shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem. Again, brethren, what is the only event in the history of this planet that this could be predicting? When did living waters go out from Jerusalem? And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Or excuse me, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. So again, this is all one block of prophecy and this is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord cometh. And it would be 
in that day when the living waters would go out from Jerusalem. And brethren, that irrefutably and that unarguably is first century. And it is in the time frame of when uh, the siege against Judah and against Jerusalem that they would look upon me whom they have pierced. So again, that is the passage from which John the Revelator is quoting when he says, Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Now, I want us to look again at this passage, especially when we look at the New King James Version. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Now, brethren, I have pointed this out previously in this series that this is Matthew 24 and verse 30. Because this phrase, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, is the exact identical same phrase that we find in Matthew 24 and verse 30, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, now, in the Greek, now it's it's varies just slightly in the King James version, but when you look at the original Greek language, it is the identical language, it is the identical phrase that we find. And when you look at this, we see all three elements. He is coming with the clouds, and that's what he says here: the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, and every eye will see him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they, all the tribes of the earth, will see. They will mourn, and they, all the tribes of the earth, will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. All the tribes of the earth, and we see all three elements are there, and that makes Revelation 1 and verse 7 identical and parallel with Matthew 24 and verse 30. And when we look then at Matthew 24 and verse 30, we see that Jesus posits this Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven when all the tribes of the earth would mourn and they would see that. He posits that in that generation. Assuredly, I say unto you, the King James Version says truly, or verily, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all, not some, not most, not all but one, but all. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So, when we look at, again, we look at Revelation 1 and verse 7, and we look at the context of things which must shortly come to pass because the time is at hand. This is how the book opens. This is how the vision opens. And this this is the setting. And it uh, tells us uh, the, what the contents of this book uh, pertains to. It pertains to things which must shortly come to pass because the time is at hand. And the book closes with the same admonitions. And he said to me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And you skip on down. He reiterates it. Behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Which is what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verses 27 and 28. So then, uh, in our study thus far, uh, we have seen that every textual objection has been demonstrated to be a glaring disconnect from the context, and in regards to this particular text here of Revelation chapter uh, 1 and verse 7 in particular, uh, in uh, Brother Travis's own words, then it must be taken at face value only. Uh, just take it as it is written. But if a text or a term uh, which causes difficulty to the futurist paradigm, 
then, well, you know, the context must be examined in every instance. So, as I pointed out in uh, the very first video of this series, that I would be demonstrating that it is the futurist paradigm which not only uh, changes the pronouns, it alters the text, it ignores context of the uh, passages which their objections are based upon, but they will be shown and be proven every time to be inconsistent in their hermeneutic. And this right here, as I have shown you, is a perfect example of that. In in one text, then we must just take it as it is written. But then when it comes to the kingdom, something that uh, gives the futurist paradigm a little more problems, then we must examine every text, everywhere that this is meant, all 342 times that uh, we read about this, then we must examine the context. So this, this demonstrates a glaring inconsistency in the hermeneutics of the futurist paradigm. Okay, we're going to end this video here. And again, I thank you for your time and your interest in uh, studying these things with us. And as always, I encourage you to study. Study your Bible. Don't take anything I say at face value. Don't take anything I say just because I'm some talking head on a video. You get your Bible out and you study the Bible for yourself and study the Old Testament. Because as I stated before, the New Testament is the Old Testament come to fruition. And we need to be understanding as best we can the Old Testament because it sheds light on how we interpret and how Jesus interpreted and how his holy apostles interpreted the scriptures. Okay, thank you so much and you have a good day.